The Publishing Ministry, Chapter 40 An Unprecedented Harvest A Harvest of Precious Souls I have been shown that the publications already have been doing a work upon some minds in other countries, in breaking down the walls of prejudice and superstition. Our earliest missionaries were sent abroad to indoctrinate and further instruct honest seekers for truth, who first learned about the Sabbath, the Second Advent, etc., by reading Seventh-day Adventist tracts and books. Thus, our literature work was in many places the opening wedge to prepare the way for the establishment of local churches and mission stations. I was shown men and women studying with intense interest papers and a few pages of tracts upon present truth. They would read the evidences so wonderful and new to them, and would open their Bibles with a deep and new interest, as subjects of truth that had been dark to them were made plain, especially the light in regard to the Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment. As they searched the Scriptures to see if these things were so, a new light shone upon their understanding, for angels were hovering over them, and impressing their minds with the truths contained in the publications they had been reading. I saw them holding papers or tracts in one hand, and the Bible in the other, while their cheeks were wet with tears, and bowing before God in earnest, humble prayer, to be guided into all truth, the very thing He was doing for them before they called upon Him. And when the truth was received in their hearts, and they saw the harmonious chain of truth, the Bible was to them a new book. They hugged it to their hearts with grateful joy, while their countenances were all aglow with happiness and holy joy. These were not satisfied with merely enjoying the light themselves, and they began to work for others. Some made great sacrifices for the truth's sake, and to help those of the brethren who were in darkness. The way is thus preparing to do a great work in the distribution of tracts and papers in other languages. Literature reaches prejudiced hearts. We have no time to lose. Important work is before us, and if we are slothful servants, we shall certainly lose the heavenly reward. But few have broad and extensive views of what can be done in reaching the people by personal, interested efforts in a wise distribution of our publications. Many who will not be induced to listen to the truth presented by the living preacher will take up a tract or a paper and peruse it. Many things they read meet their ideas exactly, and they become interested to read all it contains. Impressions are thus made upon their minds, which they cannot readily forget. The seed of truth has in some cases been buried for years beneath the rubbish of the world and the pleasing fables that deceived ones have enjoyed. After a time, some earthly sorrow or affliction softens their hearts, and the seed springs up and bears fruit to the glory of God. Again, many read these papers and tracts, and their combativeness is aroused, and they throw the silent messengers from them in a passion. But ideas all new to them have, although unwelcome, made their impression, and as the silent messenger bears the abuse without retaliation, there is nothing to feed the anger which has been excited. Again, the hand takes up the neglected paper or tract, and the eye is tracing the truthful lines and again in passion it is thrown from them as their path is crossed. But the mind is not at rest. The abused paper is at last perused, and thus point after point of truth commences its convicting work. Step by step the reformation is wrought. Self dies, and the warfare and antagonism to the truth is ended. The despised paper or tract is henceforth honored as the means of converting the stubborn heart and subduing the perverse will, bringing it in subjection to Christ. Had the living preacher spoken as pointedly, these persons would have turned from him and would not have entertained the new and strange ideas brought before them. The papers and tracts can go where the living preacher cannot go, and where, if he could go, he would have no access to the people because of their prejudice against the truth. 
I have been shown that but few have any correct idea of what the distribution of papers and tracts is doing. The missionary work, in circulating the publications upon present truth, is opening doors everywhere, and preparing minds to receive the truth when the living preacher shall come among them. The success which attends the efforts of ministers in the field is not due alone to their efforts, but in a great degree to the influence of the reading matter which has enlightened the minds of the people and removed prejudice. Thus, many are made susceptible to the influence of the truth when it is presented before them. Men of Influence to Accept Light There needs to be a waking up among God's people, that His work may be carried forward with power. We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need to understand that God will add to the ranks of His people men of ability and influence, who are to act their part in warning the world. Not all in the world are lawless and sinful. God has many thousands who have not bowed the knee to Baal. There are God-fearing men in the fallen churches. If this were not so, we should not be given the message to bear, Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen, come out of her, my people. The gospel is to be proclaimed in our cities. Men of learning and influence are to hear the message. Not only white men, but colored men of ability are to accept the faith. These are to work for their own people, and they are to be supported in doing the work the Lord desires to have done. Much more prayer, much more Christlikeness, much more conformity to God's will is to be brought into God's work. Outward show, an extravagant outlay of means, will not accomplish the work to be done. Many are gasping for a breath of life from heaven. They will recognize the gospel when it is brought to them in the way that God designs it to be brought. Precious Jewels in His Crown Christ delights to take apparently hopeless material, those whom Satan has debased and through whom he has worked, and make them the subjects of His grace. He rejoices to deliver them from suffering and from the wrath that is to fall upon the disobedient. He makes His children His agents in the accomplishment of this work, and in its success, even in this life, they find a precious reward. But what is this compared with the joy that will be theirs in the great day of final revealing? Now we see through a glass, darkly, but then face to face. Now we know in part, but then we shall know even as also we are known. Christ's redeemed ones are His jewels, His precious and peculiar treasure. They shall be as the stones of a crown, the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. In them He shall see of the travail of His soul and shall be satisfied. Eyes on the Ultimate Harvest In this life, our work for God often seems to be almost fruitless. Our efforts to do good may be earnest and persevering, yet we may not be permitted to witness their results. To us, the effort may seem to be lost. But the Savior assures us that our work is noted in heaven and that the recompense cannot fail. The Apostle Paul, writing by the Holy Spirit, says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And in the words of the psalmist we read, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And while the great final reward is given at Christ's coming, true-hearted service for God brings a reward even in this life. Obstacles, opposition, and bitter heartbreaking discouragements the worker will have to meet. He may not see the fruit of his toil, but in face of all this he finds in his labor a blessed recompense. All who surrender themselves to God in unselfish service for humanity are in cooperation with the Lord of glory. This thought sweetens all toil, it braces the will, it nerves the spirit for whatever may befall. Working with unselfish heart, ennobled by being partakers of Christ's sufferings, 
sharing his sympathies. They help to swell the tide of his joy and bring honor and praise to his exalted name. And while much of the fruit of their labor is not apparent in this life, God's workers have his sure promise of ultimate success. As the world's Redeemer, Christ was constantly confronted with apparent failure. He seemed to do little of the work which he longed to do in uplifting and saving. Satanic agencies were constantly working to obstruct his way. But he would not be discouraged. Ever before him he saw the result of his mission. He knew that truth would finally triumph in the contest with evil. And to his disciples he said, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. The life of Christ's disciples is to be like his, a series of uninterrupted victories, not seen to be such here, but recognized as such in the great hereafter. Seeing the Results of a Life Work Moses renounced a prospective kingdom. Paul the advantages of wealth and honor among his people for a life of burden-bearing in God's service. To many, the life of these men appears one of renunciation and sacrifice. Was it really so? Moses counted the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. He counted it so because it was so. Paul declared, What things were gained to me, these have I counted loss for Christ. Yea, verily, and I count all things to be loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but refuse, that I may gain Christ. He was satisfied with his choice. Moses was offered the palace of the pharaohs and the monarch's throne, but the sinful pleasures that make men forget God were in those lordly courts, and he chose instead the durable riches and righteousness. Instead of linking himself with the greatness of Egypt, he chose to bind up his life with God's purpose. Instead of giving laws to Egypt, he, by divine direction, enacted laws for the world. He became God's instrument in giving to men those principles that are the safeguard alike of the home and of society, that are the cornerstone of the prosperity of nations, principles recognized today by the world's greatest men as the foundation of all that is best in human governments. The greatness of Egypt is in the dust. Its power and civilization have passed away, but the work of Moses can never perish. The great principles of righteousness which he lived to establish are eternal. Who can measure the results to the world of Paul's life work? Of all those beneficent influences that alleviate suffering, that comfort sorrow, that restrain evil, that uplift life from the selfish and the sensual, and glorify it with the hope of immortality, how much is due to the labors of Paul and his fellow workers, as with the gospel of the Son of God they made their unnoticed journey from Asia to the shores of Europe. What is it worth to any life to have been God's instrument in setting in motion such influences of blessing? What will it be worth in eternity to witness the results of such a life work? Truth Soon to Triumph The end is near, stealing upon us stealthily, imperceptibly, like the noiseless approach of a thief in the night. May the Lord grant that we shall no longer sleep as do others, but that we shall watch and be sober. The truth is soon to triumph gloriously, and all who now choose to be laborers together with God will triumph with it. The time is short. The night soon cometh when no man can work. Conversions as at Pentecost The time is coming when there will be as many converted in a day as there were on the day of Pentecost after the disciples had received the Holy Spirit. From Obscurity to Strength The work begun in feebleness and obscurity has continued to increase and strengthen. 
publishing houses and missions in many lands attest its growth. In place of the addition of our first paper, carried to the post office in a carpet bag, many hundreds of thousands of copies of our various periodicals are now sent out monthly from the offices of publication. The hand of God has been with His work to prosper and build it up. The Church Triumphant The work is soon to close. The members of the Church Militant who have proved faithful will become the Church Triumphant. And still our General, who never makes a mistake, says to us, Advance, enter new territory, lift the standard in every land, arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. The time has come when through God's messengers the scroll is being unrolled to the world. The truth contained in the first, second, and third angel's messages must go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. It must lighten the darkness of every continent and extend to the islands of the sea. There must be no delay in this work. Our watchword is to be, Onward, ever onward, angels of heaven will go before us to prepare the way. Our burden for the regions beyond can never be laid down till the whole earth is lightened with the glory of the Lord. Gratitude of the Redeemed All praise, honor, and glory will be given to God and to the Lamb for our redemption. But it will not detract from the glory of God to express gratitude to the instrumentality He has employed in the salvation of souls ready to perish. The redeemed will meet and recognize those whose attention they have directed to the uplifted Savior. What blessed converse they have with these souls! I was a sinner, it will be said, without God and without hope in the world, and you came to me and drew my attention to the precious Savior as my only hope. And I believed in Him. I repented of my sins and was made to sit together with His saints in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Others will say, I was a heathen in heathen lands. You left your friends and comfortable home and came to teach me how to find Jesus and believe in Him as the only true God. I demolished my idols and worshipped God, and now I see Him face to face. I am saved, eternally saved, ever to behold Him whom I love. I then saw Him only with the eye of faith, but now I see Him as He is. I can now express my gratitude for His redeeming mercy to Him who loved me and washed me from my sins in His own blood." Others will express their gratitude to those who fed the hungry and clothed the naked. When despair bound my soul in unbelief, the Lord sent you to me, they say, to speak words of hope and comfort. You brought me food for my physical necessities, and you opened to me the word of God, awakening me to my spiritual needs. You treated me as a brother. You sympathized with me in my sorrows and restored my bruised and wounded soul so that I could grasp the hand of Christ that was reached out to save me. In my ignorance you taught me patiently that I had a Father in heaven who cared for me. You read to me the precious promises of God's word. You inspired in me faith that he would save me. My heart was softened, subdued, broken, as I contemplated the sacrifice which Christ had made for me. I became hungry for the bread of life, and the truth was precious to my soul. I am here, saved, eternally saved, ever to live in His presence, and to praise Him who gave His life for me. What rejoicing there will be, as these redeemed ones meet and greet those who have had a burden in their behalf! and those who have lived, not to please themselves, but to be a blessing to the unfortunate who have so few blessings, how their hearts will thrill with satisfaction. They will realize the promise, Thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Thou shalt delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, 
and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it.